let's tackle websites first. And I want to highlight with websites seven things not to do and seven things to do. Based on the discipleship framework, the life transformation path that you've created. Now, pro tip. Just so you know, you, you probably already realize this one's true. Your website is your digital footprint, and it is the first place people will go to visit your church before they ever even show up. It is the front door. There was a day when Sunday school was the front door. P people would come to like a class to see if they even liked the church. And if they liked the class, they might go to the church service. It, because the classes were so great. I mean, that, that was the case, I think, when I was a, a little kid. <laughs> We'd have people that came to Sunday school and then they exited. They left before, like, quote, big church. Um, it shifted. And I think in the 90s and early 2000s, worship, the service really became the front door. People are going to attend your church service before they attend a small group or Sunday school class. So it kind of flipped. Now it's your online presence. That is the front door. Meaning if they don't walk through the front door, they're not coming into the house for the most part unless they find another sneaky, tricky way, accidental way in. So that's why we're really talking about this right now. That's probably why you're in this training. Seven common website errors, seven things not to do and seven things to do. I'm going to go super quick on this because there's some bonus training that you can have access to that goes into great detail on each of these. So mistake number one that I see a lot of churches and nonprofits use is they overload insider language. Mistake number one is inside information, using words, acronyms, abbreviations, and other ways to communicate that the average person you are trying to reach does not understand. For uh, about six months, I was doing some consulting with a nonprofit in my hometown, and they had an acronym for everything, two and three letter abbreviations for everything all across their website. They staff readily use these acronyms to refer to different programs and processes and opportunities people could use to get engaged with those people and serve them through uh, a life transformation path of counseling and some other helps that they offered. The problem was when people went to their website, nobody that was new and needed those services understood what those words actually meant. And so as a result, they'd get to the website and they would just bounce. Now, that was one of the first things that I told them. I said, hey, um, I, we got to get rid of the insider language. Like you can use it to insiders. Like when you're here making a quick email or a note, it might make sense or in staff meeting, hey, to use that insider language, you don't have to say the whole words every time, but on the website, when you answer the phone, you're talking to people and on your forms and registrations, you got to actually use the name because people are confused. And one of the gals there that was leading the ministry, a oh, precious person, she said, well, nobody's ever told me they're confused. And I told her, I said, confused people don't generally say especially if they're new. If they're in a relationship with you, it's different. But if they're new, they don't necessarily say, hey, I don't understand. They just bounce and move on. So mistake number one is overloading your site with insider information. Here's what that means if you're a charismatic church. If you overload it with we're prophetic or we believe in the apostolic, or we you believe in all that. You don't have to get rid of those words. It means that you got to define those words now. If you say something like the term I see on a lot of church websites, corporate worship, well, people that are outside the church don't know what corporate worship is. Corporate to them is business, not necessarily. I, I know, because I grew up in a church that you mean, oh, that's a large group worship service. If you say blended worship or contemporary worship or, I mean, what is all of this? You really have got to uh, make sure 
you're not using abbreviations, acronyms. If there's a children's program and you've got a youth program and you're using abbreviations, like don't just assume that people are going to know what that is. Spell it out. That's website error number one is insider language. Number two is your website is disorganized. So mistake two is not recognizing who's coming and forgetting to organize it in such a way that the newest person can quickly find out Notice this, who you are, what you do, and why they would want to attend, where to attend, when to attend, that sort of information. Think about it like this. If I said, uh, hey, I've got, uh, yeah, I got some clothes that I'm going to give to the thrift store uh, in town, and you guys can just come pick it up. Uh, I might not be here when you get here. You can just come pick it up. Now, where would I put those clothes, that bag, that sack of goodies to give to the thrift store? I would put it either at the end of my driveway, kind of tucked under the garage where there's a little bit of an awning to where if it rained or something, you know, nothing would get on it. Or I would put it on the front porch. Probably the front porch. I would not set it on the back deck. I would not set it in the basement. I would not set it way tucked in the backyard. I would not put it behind a tree, even in the front yard, behind a bush. I would put it where they could find it quickly, easily, where they would even think to look for it, even if I didn't give them instructions. I just had my address and they showed up. And, you know, if I had to run out last minute, I might just put a little note on, hey, this is it. But they would know to look there. Why? Because they're coming to the front door. Now, when people come to your website, if you are a church, a ministry, put it where they can find it. What do people who are coming to your website want to know? They want to know when you meet. They want to know where you meet. In some degree, they want to know what to do with their kids, all those sorts of details. I remember doing some consulting for another organization uh, in the last year, that is a network of multiple churches. And so what I had to do is put some of these leaders on the network's website. And that means each leader had kind of a little blurb about their name, where they served, you know, if it was a nonprofit or a church, uh, most of them were churches, uh, or some, some were business leaders, a little short bio they had provided. And so some of these had provided us the the url the domain name for their church website some of them i had to just do a quick google search and find and that meant when i would go there i'd kind of put you know the url on their bio page there were multiple multiple meaning not just one where i could go to that website and i could find information about who the pastor was i could find out information about where the pastor met his, quote, smoking hot wife or gorgeous wife. I don't even know why you would use that information or those specific terms on a church website or, or any website. Like, I could not find, however, even though I could find out when he went to college and where he went to college, what his degree it was, what time they met. One church had a picture of the building, did not have an address. And remember, I'm looking for it because I'm getting paid to find it. Now, the average visitor coming to your site, you know what they need. Serve it just like those thrift store goodies where they will find it, organize it with the newest person in mind. Uh, another common website information uh, or error is having irrelevant info. Stuff that doesn't matter to the newest person. Uh, so here's the mistake. Number three is talking about things that are not pertinent at this point in their journey, such as a long doctrinal statement. I mean, I have read theological tomes on web pages, an extensive bio of the pastor, including, again, the example of before where he met a spouse, uh, what degrees, the names of his kids. People that are coming to visit your church don't care that you have three kids or four or that their names are Tom, Dick, Harry, and Sally. That They don't care about the long, extended, doctrinal 
theological statement and your arguments for pre, post, amillennial, the gifts of the spirit, all the healing, you know, they don't, they're, they're like, that's not where they're at yet. Now, arguably, let me make sure you hear this. Uh, some of the content you include is likely more important, but it's just not relevant yet. They want to know where to show up, what to do with their kids, and what to wear. That, that's about it. That's what they need to know to get through the front door to come see you. And remember, if they can't get the front door, they can't get into the house unless they find it in a sneaky way. Another error is being out of date. Mistake number four, out of date. Not paying attention to your site and letting that thing lapse. So uh, typically you see this with the content and or the calendar content uh, that might be you've updated the sermons and posted them but not for the last six months uh, you have a calendar that has out-of-date information i mean you can use a plug-in from google calendar um, that's what we use with crosswinds a nonprofit um, that i've done all of the ptsd and moral injury work with about veterans we use a Google Calendar because it just automatically updates itself. We can drop in our speaking engagements, our training. We can put web links in there and it just shifts automatically. I mean, there, there are so many solutions for this. Uh, you know, having a bulletin on your site, but the bulletin is from three years ago is the most recent one. Got to keep that thing up to date. Mistake number five is sending people away. Mistake number five, sending people away from the site to social media. Never do this. Now, this one is such an important point that I'm going to come back to this in a moment when we talk about social media. Error number six is no next step. So not having a next step means... Uh, the opposite is true. You should always invite them to engage with you somehow at a deeper level. So always, always let them have something they can do to sign up, to watch a sermon. I'm going to talk a little bit about that in just a moment to receive more information, to let you know they're coming and, and, and not just sign up, oh, I'm coming on Sunday, but actually giving them a next step to connect with a live human being on the other side of that. And the mistake number seven, uh, and I've got it illustrated here on the bottom, is there's no way for them to give you money. Some people will want to donate, especially if they're following you online and they're not attending every single week. If they're homebound or if they're out of state or if they're on vacation or if they just stumble upon your live stream, uh, they may want to give. And so you need to have a way that they can actually participate with that. So now, now that you know what not to do, let me tell you a couple things to do. Seven of them, in fact. And uh, then I'll show you where you can bounce for deeper, longer, protracted training on this. Number one, you want to be clean and concise and clutter-free. Now, at the end of module seven, we're going to actually build out a site, and I've got a way that you can get a free template, and all of that's where literally you can start plugging and play. You can change the colors of it and then change the shape of the buttons and drop in different pictures, and then it will look radically like you, especially you put your name and logo on that thing. Number two is you want to capture their contact info. So use an opt-in tailored to where they are in their journey. And if you do that, you'll know how you can serve them better as well as understand how to follow up with them. Now, we'll come back to this concept several times throughout these modules. Here's how an opt-in works. Uh, on the website, you present them with a free gift. That's an offer that's presented. It might be a download. It might be some audio. It might be some video. It might be a course, some training. You provide that. Uh, if you're wondering, well, what do those look like? Where do I find them? We've got them all over our website, or you can hit reply to my email, and I'll, I'll send you like three or four different examples to where you can see those. Um, they fill out a web form or... 
even now you can do this to some degree with text. Uh, but for the most part, it works with a web form. So they supply an email address and then you deliver the information to their inbox and you follow up with an email sequence. Now, you can automate all of this. And that means that if you do, you have a way to connect and communicate with people that's running on autopilot in the background of your website every single day consistently leading people to a next best step that's along your discipleship framework uh, let me show you what else you could put up there uh, so possibilities and ideas might include your membership class uh, a lot of times church leaders they ask me if i give people access to my membership class online will it cannibalize people attending in person and i tell them i don't think it will um so far the data that i've looked at doesn't support that it does if anything it might lead them to oh hey this is great information i want to go get a full dose of it in person uh, what i've seen with one of the latest classes courses that we run on repeat with crosswinds now it's a little bit different because we're leading people ptsd and moral injury is oh we'll give people access to that online uh we'll train it and the same people sign up to view it they come to a one-day training they come back to two-day multi-hour multi-day trainings if you are leading people along a framework that makes sense that helps move them from where they are to where god has designed them to be that helps them find and fulfill their purpose and deploy into their full potential not the full potential of your church or organization where they can meet your needs but you help meet their call oh man it's not going to cannibalize it at all if anything it may do the opposite it may fuel it the other thing you could provide is a high need sermon series I mean, just serve it up rather than putting a sermon archive only and letting people hunt through the sermon archives to find out something that may be relevant to them. I mean, you could have a form right there that even says, hey, um, we'll help you find a sermon series. We'll help you find a series of talks or something relevant to you. And so fill out this little form and they fill it out and they go, OK, I'm a parent or, hey, man, I'm struggling financially. Or you just ask them, what's your biggest point of need? And once they tell you, you serve them, you know, three or four of your hot ones. They don't even have to be from the same series. You just tailor make it and you can automate all of this. So take a sermon series on high needs topics, parenting, finances, time management, marriage, offer it as a free audio course serve it up uh there is a bonus module you've got access to it if you're watching this through the online training uh opt-ins and offers um now when people think offer that is generally a sell uh so from a business side that's something you might use as a business um but but look at that and watch the opt-in side of the training and it will show you exactly how this works, how you automate it, how you tie forms to emails. And I'll tell you this, the technology right now has never been easier than it is right this second. In fact, I don't, I don't know if there's a possible way it could get easy, easier. I'm, I'm sure it will. The bigger strategy or tactic for you is not going to be solving the technology. The bigger issue is going to be identifying the strategy, the path that you're going to lead people down, and then aligning the tech to serve that path and finding someone that can do that to where you don't have to dedicate your hours to doing the tech. You can keep creating that path and serving people and shepherding them and loving them and doing the reasons that you got into this in the first place, which was to love and to shepherd and transform the lives of people. But the technology to serve that life transformation process has never, ever been easier. 
So thing number one to do on your website is let's just put some numbers so this is easier to keep up with is number one, be clean and concise. Number two is to capture their contact information. Number three is surprisingly overlooked a lot by organizations. Provide contact information for you. Make sure they can email, they can call, they can complete a form. Uh, you might even want to say, let's just put an, uh, another one right here. Let's just add this in. Uh, they could call or they could text. Let, let them communicate with you how they want to communicate with you, which then tells you a lot about how to respond with them. If somebody calls you, call them back. If somebody emails you, email them back. If they text, hey, they may want to be texted back. You know, that really gives you information of the way that you can serve them uh, relationally. Number four is content delivery. Provide them with a taste of what you teach. Now, let me make a note here that I'll come back to probably multiple times is you may or may not need to provide video on your website. If you can't do the video extremely well, meaning good lighting, meaning uh, good camera angles, uh, meaning people can actually see you and you have the ability to edit out, you know, don't do 30 minutes of announcements and, you know, singing that, you know, really the sound quality is not good. If you don't have the ability to do video right now, provide content of the audio. The audio is super easy. You you can use the microphone from your iPhone or your iPad sitting up there at the pulpit and not even run that through the sound system. And you can get a great audio. But provide people with a taste of what you teach. I mean, think about it like this. You are producing the best content on the planet with the greatest message in the universe and the hope that people need. Serve it up. Give it new life. Number five is collect money. Have a clear place to donate. You don't have to be salesy or slapstick or put a thermometer on there or anything like that. But make sure that it's just very clear. Uh, the guy that I work with at Crosswinds, Bob Walter, who founded the organization, he has actually told me for years, put a big yellow donate button at the top of the website. And that's it. You don't have to give it a sales pitch. Just make it easy. People get there, want to give. Oh, hey, there's that's where I do it. People aren't surprised that churches and nonprofits collect money. Uh, so make it super simple for people to find that. Number six, call to action. Uh, give them a next best step to engage with you. Ideally, something that's related to your discipleship path. So what does that mean? Uh, that means your call to action may be, hey, the best way to engage with us at a deeper level is every first Sunday of the month, we start a new class. Register here. Uh, it might be, hey, um, get a taste of our course or our discipleship framework or however we do it. Get a taste of it right here. Download this PDF that outlines the steps. Or it might be, here's a couple clips on video that spells out the best ways to get involved. There are multiple ways that you can do it, but don't just have a website that sits there and then just hopes people show up. Tell them, hey, uh, the best way to get involved is call to action. Uh, hey, come on a Sunday. And if you'll sign up right here, and tell us you're coming and tell us, you know, how old your kids are. Uh, you can fill in the names and all that later, or you can provide them here. Give us as much information you're comfortable with. Uh, we will email you back the name and picture of a person that's going to meet you at the welcome desk at the time that you tell us that you want to come. And they will help you navigate the space and walk through our facility and, and that person could even sit with them. I mean, goodness, like think about the relational possibilities of something like that. Give them a next best 
step. Number seven is connection and community. Uh, invite that person into a relationship at some level. Uh, here's one of the things that we're really experimenting with on some of the business websites that we've consulted with, some of the nonprofit ministry driven websites we consulted with is, is even building like what looks like a Facebook group, but on the website, not on social media. And I, I tell you this, like, you don't have to quote build it. You just kind of turn it on and it just runs. The technology to do all of that is in place. I'll show you how, uh, at the end of the seventh module. Uh, let me give you another pro tip, okay? And this is a repeat. Your website is your digital footprint, and it is the first place people go to visit your church before they ever show up with you. Now, that can create a lot of tension, a lot of friction, and it can push people away and keep them out, or it can can be a tool that brings people in close. Um, back summer of 2023, Phil Cook, uh, he's well known in church and ministry circles for doing digital content and communication strategy. Uh, he said that he helped do some consulting for Joel Osteen back years ago when Joel Osteen took over Lakewood Church from his father. Now, uh, Lakewood Church at that time was kind of off, uh, wasn't meeting in the Compact Center, which at one point was the summit where I remember as a kid going to watch the Houston Rockets play and going to the circus, that they were on the far side of town. And as a result, a lot of people really didn't know a whole lot about the church. Uh, a lot of people heard, well, it's charismatic, it's Pentecostal, uh, you know, do people run around, do they jump the pews, do they wave flags, well, do you get hit with the tambourine, you know, do they, do they you, you know, just the weird stuff, do they handle snakes, or somebody going to prophesy or push me over, or all of this, and the Osteens had, now this is Phil Cook's version of the story, they had uh, been sharing the sermon, the teaching through a television ministry. But everybody knew that, you know, when you put it on TV, you can edit it. You don't necessarily see the whole service. And so Phil Cook actually suggested to Joel Osteen, he said, hey, why don't you broadcast the entire service, music and all, to the local Houston market just when he was first getting started when he took over the church 20 plus years ago so that people would know firsthand, hey, there's no weirdness, there's no snake handling, there's no, again, this is Phil Cook's words, and once people could see visually on TV the whole thing, I, I mean, the, 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 the wind up, the welcome, all the way to the dismiss, everything. Once people saw it and got comfortable with it, attendance exploded. All right, that's a great example. If you kind of boomerang back to how we started in the introduction, skill and the spirit, strategy that you're implementing. And obviously, the Spirit of God just kind of blew on what was going on there. And again, as I told you earlier, just remember this. You may or may not need to live stream your service. Uh, consider alternatives to this. I remember speaking with a church here in Birmingham, and they were live streaming their band. And their, their band is phenomenal. But it sounds... It, 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 this is going to sound like a slap. It's not. It sounds very raw. So if you're live and in your per, in person, it's incredible. It's authentic. Uh, the musicians are excellent. Uh, but there's no way, even though this church has phenomenal cameras and recording and sound gear and audio and visual, and I mean, they have got the tech stack. There's no way it can compete with... Bethel and Hillsong and some of the other big churches that are out there, you know, people are just going to choose, am I going to watch this or that? They're probably going to watch the other. So I actually told them, I said, you know, if I were you, here's what I would do. That raw sound that you have, it's not translating through the sound system to come out on the internet, whereas the other people are optimizing for that. So live, it's incredible. I would do this. I would live stream the sermon, but 
at 10 o'clock or whatever time you start, I wouldn't live stream the music. I would live stream somebody in the lobby actually connecting with people who were online and talking with them, like a talking head on camera, welcoming them, taking prayer requests, dialoguing about what's going on with the people there, telling them what's going on in the service. You know, maybe like just you could hear some of the music in the background, but people, let's just be honest, they're not sitting at home, standing up and worshiping in the same way that we worship with the music. They're just kind of listening to it. So what if you did something right then in that moment that no one else could do? And what if sometimes you even said, hey, we're, we're going on a mission trip. And so uh, next next week, we're going to do the live stream from wherever we are. We're going to do this part from over there. You just figure out the time zones and all that kind of stuff. Or you even do some stuff on location. You say, hey, we're going to do a baptism at the local uh, community pool, and we're going to live stream that back into the, quote, real service. You know, there are so many possibilities that you could do here. So figure out your lane and how it fits with the discipleship framework that you're trying to do, and then get on it now. I went through all that stuff pretty quick. There are more details and all kinds of graphics and things you could see in this bonus module, eight essentials for your website. If you're watching this on the course, you've got access to that. And so you could go there or you could send someone that's on your team there.